2015 will be the year that the strongest mobile platforms will fight to take control of your wrist. Let's talk smartwatches. Afternoon. City daylight time will be. Famous writer Oscar Wilde once said, Life imitates art more than art imitates life. And in the case of smartwatches, tech companies definitely imitate the art of science fiction. For sure, these epic movie scenes influence today's smartwatch innovators for better and for worse. Had baby will do everything but tell you what time. It doesn't tell time? No. There was so much stuffed into it, there was no more room for the clock. Come in, Pat. This is Tracy. Those guys hate each other. Gotta get over here. Man. I gotta find that together. Right, let's go. But first, some history. The first wristwatches were definitely more works of art. So 175 years ago, Patek and Philippe marketed the first wristwatches as more jewelry than timepieces. But the company survived all this time because it pursued perfection, focusing on the highest level of quality and the greatest mechanical innovations. They invented the perpetual calendar, a chronograph, and winding watches with a crown. Now eventually the rest of the world saw the value in keeping time on your wrist, and keeping time became the first application of wearable technology. And now once again, technology is moving from our pockets to our wrists. So let's explore the next phase of smartwatch technology. Let's explore how tech companies are trying to make smartwatches more beautiful, more functional, and more necessary to our modern lives. Part 1. Too little, too early. Seiko pioneered the first watch with user programmable memory, and Casio sold a bunch of these calculator watches in the 80s. Then, all the major tech companies of the time, with all their cash, gave it a shot. Microsoft and Timex worked together on a watch that connects to your computer, and Samsung made the first of many attempts to make the Dick Tracy watch a reality. But it was a creative engineer who figured out the right formula by installing Linux on the first general purpose wearable computer. Then, as big companies have always done, IBM and Citizen ran with this idea trying to introduce the Linux smartwatch to market first. The so-called watchpad could send and receive alphanumeric pages. Before texting, all the cool kids had pagers. It had a calendar, could sync via Bluetooth, had a touch screen, and a fingerprint sensor. So IBM envisioned a platform where businesses would install Bluetooth hotspots, enabling watchpad users to check into hotels and even pay for things from their watch. Remember, this was 15 years ago, but the platform had size, scale, and performance issues. It was too early. So watch companies gave it a shot with the Fossil PDA running Palm OS, but it didn't have wireless connectivity. And 10 years ago, Microsoft built a wireless platform on FM radio spectrum to send data to all kinds of smart products, including smartwatches, but then smartphones took over. So after all these failures, is now the time that smartwatches actually become mainstream? Will they survive this time around? Part two, proof of concept. First, let's talk functions. Today, the tech industry is different Mobile has become the center of innovation, and new smartwatches can rely on a much healthier supply chain, the smartphone supply chain. There are now 2 billion smartphones throughout the world, and Linux-based operating systems like iOS and Android have become more powerful yet more efficient. They use less memory, less storage, and conserve battery life. And there's a strong ecosystem of mobile developers who are ready to create the next best app. But it's not enough to have supply in place, New markets need demand to grow. So the big question really is, will the mainstream really want to use a smartwatch? When we look at the past failures of Microsoft, IBM, and Samsung, it makes sense that a lot of investors couldn't see the potential. After all, producing hardware is extremely complex and risky. But then this device changed everybody's mind. Two or three years ago, they proved that people really wanted a smartwatch. Story goes, after venture capitalists refused to invest, Pebble took its offerings to the public through Kickstarter and raised a record amount of money. And the company got a lot of things right that have now become standards in wearable technology. Things like Bluetooth 4.0, a low energy radio, magnetic charging with no open ports to seal the device for water resistance, standard motion sensors, an open API for developers, and interchangeable straps for custom designs. And it has some unique features like an e-paper display that gives it seven days of battery life, and it's probably the only smartwatch that is truly cross-platform. So after Pebble proved the concept of smartwatches, all the major tech companies jumped in. But from a marketing perspective, in order to create demand, these smartwatches need a killer app, 
something that proves the value of smartwatches to average consumers. For example, Super Mario Brothers saved consoles in the mid 80s, word processing and spreadsheets made PCs a necessity for the home and business, and iTunes and a full web browser helped the iPhone get off to a good start. So for smartwatches, companies need to create and promote that specific killer app. Things that easily move from our pockets to our wrists. Things that allow us to keep our smartphones in our pockets or purses. Skipping over some previous generations, let's see what all smartwatches sold today have in common. For hardware, most smartphones sold today must have Bluetooth 4.0 to sync to a phone, half a gig of RAM, four gigs of storage, motion and light sensors, a microphone, and a heart rate sensor. Smartwatches should really function as an extension of phones. Now let's see how all these Android watches differ. The LG G Watch is more about power than design. It has powerful processing with an always on IPS LCD display, but that display and the power requirements demand a bigger battery and a bigger size, but still it's relatively thin. And while IPS displays do have accurate colors, they don't perform too well outside and it's one of the few devices without a heart rate sensor. The G-Watch R addresses the design issue by taking cues from traditional watches. Like the G-Watch, it's bulky and powerful, but it also offers better fitness features using a heart rate monitor and barometer to measure altitude. And it has a higher resolution OLED display with better contrast ratios and viewing angles. On the downside, both LG watches require a dock to charge, so that means no magnetic charging. And since we're on the theme of round designs, the Moto 360 is lighter and has more wrist-friendly features. And it supports the wireless Qi charging standard, so no physical connections required. Besides the heart rate monitor, it has a vibration motor. And for a watch, this should really be a standard feedback mechanism, because only I want to know if I get an alert, not the whole room. The dual microphones have better audio reception, and it has a strong Gorilla Glass 3 face. And while the screen is bigger than the LG, it is a lower resolution IPS display. It's also lighter and thicker than the G-Watch. At the high end, the Samsung Gear S is a premium device. It moves display technology forward and, unlike other smartwatches, functions as a standalone Samsung smartphone. In other words, Samsung really wants to make the Dick Tracy watch. It has a curved Super AMOLED 2-inch display that fits more screen, more pixels, and brighter colors onto your wrist. And it's the first wearable device to include the entire radio stack. That's Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, GPS, and 3G connecting directly to the internet without a smartphone. Besides the barometer, this thing even has a UV sensor to detect too much sun. Now it's the heaviest at 67 grams, and it's fully Samsung, even down to the Exynos 4 Dual running Tizen. On the downside, it has no direct Android Wear compatibility, so it's really like the Apple Watch, limiting itself to Samsung devices. Like the Gear S, the Gear 2 is all Samsung, but a little cheaper. The company also tried to throw on some features like a 2 megapixel 720p video camera, uh, you know, just in case you want to take pictures from your watch. It does have the same high-res AMOLED display, a heart rate sensor, runs Tizen on an Exynos 3250, and it's a similar size as the G-Watch. It functions as a standalone music player, has an IR sensor to control the TV, and again, it's compatible only with Samsung devices. By the way, the Gear 2 Neo is identical, except it's made from plastic, without the camera, and it's 100 bucks cheaper. So if you have a Samsung smartphone, then the Gear 2 Neo is probably the sweet spot for you. But if you just want an Android Wear smartwatch from Samsung, the Gear Live is your best bet. Announced at Google I.O., the Gear Live runs Android Wear, making it compatible with any Android 4.3 phone. It has the same display, it's similar to the G-Watch in that it runs on the same processor, has the same width, but it's taller, thinner, and lighter. Now, Samsung did sacrifice some battery life to make it more appealing, but the screen is brighter than the G-Watch, but again, it has no magnetic charging. Now, finally, we get to the upcoming Apple Watch, and while all details aren't fully revealed, we do know a lot of information so far. Apple is approaching watches as functional jewelry with a really diverse product lineup, 34 different models. Releasing in late April, like Samsung, an Apple Watch is an integrated product. It runs its own watch OS, needs an iPhone 5 or above to work, has free-floating circular apps, a WatchKit API for developers, and a digital crown for user input. The flexible retina display detects touch and force, 
So that means it's able to distinguish between a light tap and a deep press. For processing power, the Apple S1 is a proprietary system and package with all the sensors and radios built onto one piece of silicone, but coated in resin in order to keep it water resistant. Now, Apple has built some really unique communication tools for the Apple Watch, things that they hope will become its killer app. Like the Moto 360, the Apple Watch has a taptic engine that gives you physical notifications except in the case of Apple, they actually built the infrastructure to send taps and even heartbeats to other Apple Watch users. For fitness, it has a heart rate sensor and a barometer to measure altitude. And Apple is developing a new UI that includes informational summaries called glances. Now, Apple is also releasing a ton of different versions. There'll be three models with three different cases and three different types of bands. The Apple Sport will have a composite black, anodized aluminum case, an ion X glass as a face, and plastic bands as options. The Apple Watch will have a ceramic back, a stainless steel case, a sapphire crystal face, and leather, steel, or plastic band options. And the Apple Watch Edition will have a ceramic back, an 18 karat gold case, a sapphire crystal display, and either leather or plastic band options. There'll be two different heights, and Apple seems to be giving itself the room to price this from $350, probably over up to close to a thousand. I wouldn't be surprised if they even went beyond that. So I'll be sure to upload a video once we get the official information at launch. Now both Apple and Samsung are building on what's called a halo effect. Their smart watches are supposed to work better and have more value when you integrate them with an existing ecosystem of devices. So in the case of the Apple Watch, that means it'll work with Apple Pay, the Apple TV, it'll function as a walkie-talkie between other Apple Watch users, and you can even use it as a viewfinder for your iPhone camera. And Apple's iBeacons seem to be following IBM's blueprint for Bluetooth hotspots over a decade earlier. As retailers install these in their stores, they'll be able to feed information to iPhones and Apple Watches as people do their shopping. And even traditional watch companies are starting to take the threat seriously, with Swatch releasing its own smartwatch this year. But the magic will really be in the app in the software. People want to know what can they do with a smartwatch and which platforms have the most potential for growth. And on the flip side, innovative developers will focus their limited resources on which platforms have the most engaged user base, where they can make the most money. So as technology moves from the pocket to our wrists, past companies failed because they didn't think big enough or because the designs and features didn't appeal to most people. But in the future, the companies with the strongest platforms, with the most attractive designs, and with the most innovative developers will attract customers who want to make technology more useful, more beautiful, more wearable. But hopefully humanity doesn't take it this far. No. Holy Christ. Holy Christ. Holy Christ, there's nothing left. Afternoon. The daylight time will be. So thank you guys for liking, sharing, and subscribing. As always, I read all your comments, even though I may not respond to all of them. I really appreciate the feedback in the last video, especially when I didn't spell this word right. So thank you for catching that. Sometimes these little things will slip through the cracks. And uh, my goal is really just to produce as much content as possible, hopefully getting it up to two or three videos a week. Um, I saw your comments about throttling, especially with people who own a PS4, Xbox One, or a Steam machine, and they're downloading a lot of games. It's definitely plausible that uh, last mile providers are trying to limit the amount of information we download. So now that the FCC is regulating them as Title II carriers, hopefully we'll see less and less of that and more fair and reasonableness from these uh, companies. Um, I also wanted to let you guys know that hopefully this will be the year that I invest in buying some products to review for you guys here on the channel. So I'm thinking smart products, smart devices, anything that um, infuses normal everyday products with the benefits of software and uh, the platforms that we use, the mobile platforms. So hopefully that's in the works. Uh, the next video I'm thinking perhaps to do something on security, especially because that's a big highlight this year with all the hacks that have been going on and all the, the value that's been destroyed and how we can protect ourselves as average consumers against that. So thank you guys, as always, for sticking with the channel as we continue to explore how technology changes the world.